I'm really happy that, uh, that you can join us. This is Dr. Jen McDonald, who's a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at the Ottawa Hospital and a lecturer at University of Ottawa. Rehabilitation physicians are experts in the interdisciplinary collaboration and are keenly aware of the physical, cognitive, and emotional sequelae of illnesses that can impact function. As such, rehab physicians are passionate about prevention of illness and injury, as are we. And uh, she's also a member of Masks for Canada and has been advocating for better mitigation measures to address airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So, including with the um, Canadian Aerosol Coalition that some of us are also on. So, thanks for joining us, Jen. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, at the end, uh, if I have any other comments, I can sort of add in if I would change anything of what I said or whatnot. So I haven't watched it in a little bit, so it'll be uh, fresh for me as well. Great. Okay, Vani, are you able to roll the video? There we go. Great. Thanks. There is certainly a lot to talk about, but we don't want to um, go on for too long for you guys. So I'll try and do this pretty quickly, but I do think it's helpful to see some of the practical sides of it. And certainly uh, at the end, Simon and Kevin, if I say anything incorrect, you know, I'm, I'm really not an expert before the pandemic. I didn't know anything about masks and uh, people like Simon and Kevin taught me so much about this topic. So um, I'm hoping to tra help translate that to, uh, to you guys today. Um, so the um, fit, uh, filtration uh, efficiency and the function of your mask is very key to prevent that um, inhalation of aerosols. Uh, so you can see here we have a nice little diagram that shows at the left it's probably not, it's still going to be helpful for aerosols but the filters uh, towards the right of the screen are going to be quite a bit more helpful and the same with the fit of your mask. So um, there's different sort of tips and tricks we can do to try and improve the fit and then we can get fancier and get a really um, approved standardized respirator um, or even fancier uh, type equipment that's going to be even better protection. And we already talked about function where we want the mask that you choose to be breathable and comfortable and of course also affordable. It would be great if we had a more uh, universal access to these fancier respirators within Canada and I hope that um, that may still be an option even if they're more affordable um, but uh, uh, more universal access would be really nice. So I'm just going to start by showing you guys a surgical mask. Um, here is a ASTM level 3 surgical mask this is by a Canadian company Vitacore. And um, so what that means is it's an excellent fluid barrier. Um, and it's actually decent at filtering uh, aerosols. Um, however, you can see it's not the best fit. So there's some gaps on the sides here. There's gaps underneath. There's even some gaps around the nose, even though I'm pressing it down, because it's not that tight either. So if I blow out, I can feel all my breath coming at the side. So it's probably leaking 20 to 50% of the air is not even going through the mask, even though the material is excellent, it's going around. Um, so how do I improve that? One option is to just use a simple um, ear saver. And what I would do there is pull it back, I'm not going to put it on here, but I would hook that on. So now I'm making my uh, mask basically a headband type mask. It's going to take less pressure on your ears and it's also going to uh, tighten it up against your face to get rid of some of this gaps. Um, one another option, which is fairly easy since many of us have lots of pretty cloth masks that we've bought over the last year, so you don't have to throw them out, you can still use them. So you put a fancier mask underneath, one that has a more proven filtration efficiency, and then you can take a cloth mask over top. So what that does is it tightens up the sides here so that there's not as much gapping. When I breathe out now, I don't feel quite as much air. And I can adjust this as well um, to fit it better. And then the other thing is um, I would choose not this one um, because this one's too thick. So I have way too many layers on here. It's feeling hot. It's kind of hard to breathe. So if you are going to do that, um, I would recommend a thinner cloth mask and one that does fit tight to your face because it's almost you're using the cloth mask like a brace. And finally, I'm going to show you what a mask brace looks like here. So um, this one is a fit, a fix the mask mask brace. Um, uh, which can be purchased. You can also make these. They have designs online for making them. Um, and you can also um, uh, 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 wait for some newer ones that are coming out. There's a Canadian made model that's sort of like a plastic shell that fits over the mask and under it, which looks really cool. So keep your eyes out for that. 
So the idea here, and you should do this in front of the mirror, and uh, I'm just going to put this on my nose here. Okay, bear with me. This isn't something that, you know, you would want to do, sorry, there we go. Um, it's not something that you would want to be wearing if you had to take it on and off multiple times in the day because it is a bit finicky. Try not to make it look too silly here. Okay, and I'm going to put that on like that. So you can see here the uh, nose piece is fitting along the bridge of my nose. It's going on the sides, it's going under my chin, and there's nothing leaking out the sides here. So now when I breathe in and out, all the air is coming through the mask. I don't feel anything leak. I could even do an actual seal check. So what I do is cut my hands over my mouth like this, inhale in and, and exhale. And when I inhale sharply, I'll feel the mask material uh, come in towards my face. And when I exhale, I felt it bulge out. So this is actually a really good option. This is probably almost as good as a respirator. Um, obviously, it's uh, uh, impromptu, It's sort of a DIY type of option because of the pandemic. It's not going to be approved for healthcare workers and high-risk workers, but it's going to do a pretty good job, and you have a nice fit for this. So certainly something to think about if you have a bunch of procedure masks that you know are decent quality lying around, you can get yourself a mask brace. Uh, next, I'm going to just quickly show you guys that... Uh, Kevin mentioned it previously, a KN95 style. So this is an ear loop uh, model. It's bifold. So what you have to do when you open these bifold ones up is actually press down the metal thing first at the top, the, ear, uh, the uh, nose piece. If you don't do that, it makes a fold and you'll have a leak spot there. So I'm going to cup it on my face. Okay. And I'm going to press that down on the sides. And you can see this mask was designed to fit around my face. So there's no big gaps um, or leak points there. The problem is it's not quite as tight because of the ear loop design, as uh, Simon was explaining. So uh, because of that, if I really blow out, I can feel a bit of air coming out the sides here. So how could I improve that even further? If I was just going you know, to a well-ventilated grocery store and maintaining my distance, this is probably good enough. It's easy to put on and off. Uh, but if I really want to, um, you know, increase my safety, I could even add a um, ear saver to the back, and now I'm really tightening it up. So now, um, if I blow out, I really don't feel anything leaking out. So that is certainly an option to improve the fit of that mask. Um, this is, I won't put this one on, but that's a true uh, N95 approved uh, mask. So the reason the reason this one's approved uh, NIOSH N95, well, sorry, it's not NIOSH approved because it's a new uh, Canadian model. Uh, but the, uh, the oh, not done yet, Ellie. Sorry, that's my daughter there. Um, so the reason this one is uh, better for healthcare is because it has the headband versus the um, ear loop design here. Um, and finally, I should have kept Ellie in here to show her the children's mask, which I almost got to, but she probably wouldn't cooperate. So here's a, this one folds open like three, like this, okay? And this is the one I wear at work. Um, I've been wearing it for almost a year now, very comfortable. You kind of push in the sides a little bit, um, and it cups on your face. Put the top mat, uh, strap up here, bottom strap down here. I'm going to pull it down and up. Press that down here, and now I'm going to try a seal check. So I'm going to put my cut my hands over, inhale sharply. I feel the mask coming in. I'm going to exhale. I feel it bulge out. I don't feel anything leaking around my eyes or around my, the cheeks. So this fits really well. And I've passed a fit test on this mask with a, a port account test, so of 200, which is the perfect you can get on that. So I do know that it does fit well for me. Um, and I should mention this is CAN99. That means it has very even better than 95% uh, uh, particle filtration efficiency. Here is a kid's mask. Um, this one is the uh, Canada Strong one. They're quite cute. Um, I know a bunch of kids who are wearing these now to school, and actually uh, everyone that I've heard from has said that their kids find them more comfortable than their old uh, cloth masks. Um, these are ear loop models, so obviously they're not going to be a perfect um, seal to the face, uh, but they do a pretty good job, um, and obviously the material is excellent. Um, and then just finally, I want to show you guys a reusable um, model. So this is an Envo mask, 
Um, so you could sort of think of it like a, a, a type of elastomeric. Um, it's actually fairly affordable if you're going to use it every day. Um, and this one, it comes with a head strap as well, but this one has ear loops, which you can actually just hook them over your head because that's obviously a better fit. Just give me a second. So I'm adjusting this here. So because it's silicone, um, it's very comfortable and it fits most face shapes. So let's do a seal check. It's sucking in towards my face, bulging out, and there's no leakage here. It does have a valve, um, and people are very worried about the valves, but there's always there's often a little bit of leakage, and there's a lot of leakage with a surgical mask. So there's actually less leakage with this um, for surgery. This is better source control than a surgical mask. Um, but you could also tape the valve um, so that the air just filters out through this material, and it would still it would work even better for source control. So my only thing about this is it does look kind of silly, so we're not used to seeing people walking around like this, so it doesn't meet the fourth F, which is fashion. But otherwise, it's an excellent option. It's very comfortable, and it uh, is a very good mask. So I think that's it. I'm going to take this off and stop looking silly. I love it so very, very much, Dr. McDonald, and especially with that fourth F of fashion. I'm going to pop back up your fit slide again before we say goodbye to this portion of the presentation because we had some requests on the YouTube to have a look at it again. But of all of the masks you talked about, you'd mentioned that the tiny humans ones had come from Canada Strong. We've been getting a lot of questions in on both Twitter and in the YouTube stream around where to shop. Where to shop for masks? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, we have a uh, the Mask for Canada created a document that has a list of a lot of the ones that have been Health Canada authorized. Um, the the sort of that um, extra layer of um, uh, standardization that, and that Simon's been talking about, so that you avoid the counterfeit ones. So if they're on that list, as well as on that CDC list that he talked about um, to avoid the counterfeit ones, then you know they're better. So we can probably link that up somewhere. It's It's got a lot of good options. Um, but there's lots of nice Canadian options now. Think, uh, I don't want to leave any out, but Eclipse, uh, Canada Strong, uh, VitaCore. Um, I think there's a, a, a Canada Mask with a Q. Um, so there's a, a bunch of uh, companies that have really stepped up. Um, there's other companies that are working on other um, uh, reusable models, which are excellent. Um, um, so I think uh, there's, and I think most of those are on that uh, document. Thanks, Bonnie. Jen, so did you have anything to add now that uh, um, you've seen it again? Yeah, I, I'll add a couple things. So I should have brought my, because I, after I did that video, I was sent one of the Dentex, um, the non-exhalation valve elastomerics, which is quite comfortable. I haven't been wearing it to work just because my hospital, I think, uh, would probably kick me out. <laughs> it's just not standard in Canada to wear elastomerics to work, unfortunately. So I would get too many uh, looks at this point. So I still wear an, uh, just a an FFP uh, three style mask, but um, it's excellent. Um, and I know John was make, making a comment there about um, the valves. There's this huge concern um, within public health and IPAC about exhalation valves being so dangerous and they've been blamed for certain outbreaks I've heard. Um, and we do know from the several NIOSH studies that um, the amount of leak uh, through that valve is at as uh, as much or probably less than a surgical mask. So it really is, a, unfortunately though, it's, it's very much ingrained within policies and um, so I don't think you could wear a, a valved mask, for instance, into a hospital. They wouldn't let you. Um, but uh, I guess the good news is that many of them, especially on the FFP style masks, can be taped up uh, and then and then pass their uh, approval. But it really is kind of silly that um, uh, we allow leaky surgical masks but don't allow a tiny uh, exhalation valve. Um, and I just wanted to show another mask I've been wearing sometimes, which I also like, is the 3M V-Flex, um, just sort of that duckbill style. Um, it's very comfortable, and it allows you to sort of, you can like open your jaw quite wide, like so actually someone has mentioned it's a good option for singers. Um, you could chew gum under it if that's something you wanted to do. Like You can just seem to, to move your jaw more and, and maintain the seal. Um, not that I'm uh, recommending you chew gum under your mask, seems kind of dangerous. Um, 
And uh, these you can buy on Staples for about a dollar a mask. So they're pretty affordable. Um, and then I also wanted to mention for the kids' masks, um, for the ear loops, so you can tie a knot um, because obviously for a, like my four-year-old, this mask is slightly too big with these loops. So you can buy these little silicone beads on uh, Amazon or anywhere and you thread them on. I use a, a hook from my Christmas tree and then you can really adjust the loop size for your child so that it's comfortable um, and that seems to work well. You could use it for an adult mask obviously as well if you're using an ear loop. Um, and then there was one other comment about the insertable filters. Um, those seem good. My concern with that is the filter, if it's insertable, it's not going to actually go to the edge of the cloth. It's not actually covering the entire area that you're breathing through. So essentially, you're dealing with the leak of this of the cloth mask, but you're also dealing with the leak around where the filter material is. So I would guess you're having at least 50% leak uh, around that filter. I don't know if it's been really measured, but it certainly would be better to me than um, some cotton cloth mask made of t-shirt, you know, t-shirt material or something. But to me, if your filter material doesn't cover the entire seal of the mask, then it seems like it might um, not be the best option. Thanks a lot. That's all very helpful to know. Uh, and I see, Kevin, you have a question? I just wanted to add a comment. Um, and just thanks so much, Jen. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you and uh, it's been an interesting ride. And I just you know, want to thank you on behalf of everyone for doing such a, a great job and for your leadership and engaging occupational hygienists as well. Um, so just, uh, but I want, wanted to say that um, something that gets missed out a lot, um, and I, I actually shaved last night on purpose. Um, because I usually have a bit of stubble, but I decided to be clean shaven because, um, and I did work in a, a lead mine for a while and being clean shaven in the lead mine was critical to getting a good face seal with your respirator. If you're unshaven, then it's you're likely that you won't pass the border camp, the quantitative fit test. So you kind of in the public, you might see people wearing fit, having humongous beards and having this tiny little face covering in the middle of the beard and the air is just going to go in around the beard but you really need to think about if, if we're serious about this for the public you know us fellas really need to be clean shaven uh, us sorry us us unshaven people to be gender spe non-specific need to be uh, clean shaven i thought i'd just add that thanks yeah that that is an important and it, it is uh, it is something to remember, and it is a challenge for unshaven people to manage, too, I think. So um, I see Cheryl Lynn has mentioned this chronic problem, which I, uh, astonishingly still seems to exist, that people are demanded to remove their respirator in order to don a baggy blue when they go to a healthcare facility. Um, is that happening? So I was going to ask you about your experience in terms of as a physician in the hospital, how are are you still unique among your peers, or are more of them wearing respirators? And are the same? Is there any shift in the policy of this just absolute dogmatic um, insistent on insistence on surgical masks in healthcare? There is a slow shift now, especially I think a lot of physicians. Um, obviously, we want to trust the IPAC experts, and you know, and we obviously did at the beginning. But as we sort of learn more and more, you know, you have to sort of also follow the science. And if you know, if certain experts are behind in the science, then I think we need to take matters into our own hands and protect ourselves and our patients. Because it's really not about just protecting yourself, right? We're protecting our families, we're protecting our patients. We can prevent large, you know, potentially devastating outbreaks at the hospital. So um, within my division, um, there's a bigger uptake in N95s, obviously, because I've been um, pushing it amongst my colleagues and my trainees. Anyone who has trained with me in the last several months is now wearing respirators. <laughs> um, whether they felt pressured or not, I don't think so. Um, I also buy my residents' uh, respirators and leave them in their uh, uh, call room mm -hmm. um, just so that I don't feel like I'm wearing better protection than them. Um, but that's the type of things that I'm happy to do right now, which is unfortunate. Um, in terms of across the countries, now that you know we've realized that vaccines aren't 100% effective. We realize there's new variants. Um, 
there are more there's more talk of physicians who are sort of like yeah you're probably right but i feel i feel safe because of the vaccine you know covid's almost over anyway that was the sort of attitude and it's like people are just tired they've been working their butts off and they don't really have like the mental energy to think about this new safety concern right um so i think in the last i would say couple of weeks there's a lot more i'm i'm hearing a lot more on our sort of around the country of, of physicians adopting uh, uh, respiratory protection, but many actually buying their own equipment. And then it does create an issue amongst, you know, what about the uh, custodial staff at the hospital? What about some of the nurses and PSWs that don't um, maybe, you know, if I walk through the door in my respirator, no one says anything. But if one of my nursing colleagues walked through the door in a respirator, her manager would probably have something to say, especially if it wasn't, if she brought it in um so that's obviously a, a real issue yeah uh, um yeah that fight continues i think um uh on many levels and in schools too right and the the need to to do these presentations to school boards to allow teachers to bring in their own respirators um instead of uh the default uh too it's uh, the fight i think still continues across the province um I wanted but, to ask. Sorry, can I just I, wanted can to just sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to quickly mention that um, a lot of physicians and nurses have been fit tested on just the classic hard cup shell style respirator, and we know there are lots of other options now which can be more comfortable and still pass a fit test. So. Um, and obviously elastomerics can be much more comfortable. Um, so I think part of the issue is a bias of just the one, you know, classic 3M cup shell that they've, you know, squished on their face and made it fit. Um, and it's just, it is uncomfortable to wear that all day. Um, so a lot of uh, these healthcare workers need to, to realize the other options that are out there uh, that would be more comfortable for them. Because yes, I don't think people should be in pain or struggling to breathe through the day. And that's not obviously what we're asking. It's for, if you have one that is uncomfortable, they should be finding one that is not uncomfortable since we do have many options now. Yeah, John has made that point for years about the studies around the donning and the doffing or whatever, and that the whole point is, well, then figure out one that does work and is comfortable enough for someone to wear for this many hours so they can be protected at, at work. Kevin, sorry, I think I interrupted you there. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so in Australia, uh, the AIOH, Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists, has done a lot of work on counterfeit respirators, and they produced a document they provided online. Um, so, but just to seg segue from that, when I bought my KN95, which is a compromise for, you know, a KN99 that I typically wear, I had a look on the Health Canada website just to see if the KN95 was listed on the Health Canada. So for everybody on the call that's thinking about going and, and buy, you know, buying their respirator online, I suggest you have a look at the Health Canada website just to make sure it's listed there, because there could be still a lot of there could be a lot of counterfeit respirators out there as well. Thanks. And, uh, uh, two more questions, although I just see Ryan, you've uh, uh, <laughs> you've obviously looked at Twitter this afternoon, and I haven't. I've been uh, trying to behave uh, in terms of yeah, the data out of the UK uh, around vaccine evasion of Omicron and and reinfection, right? being that protection double vaccination only 40 percent protective so definitely the airborne risk is 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 significant did you want to add anything specifically ryan yeah i guess just to kind of re-emphasize um what dr mcdonald was saying i think it's the fact that you know now we can't just sit back and say oh look we're vaccinated um we don't know what the threat um with omicron will be over this next little bit uh the government literally just opened up um like boosters to 18 plus on January 4th. Um, that still doesn't mean that everyone's going to get in that day. Um, and then you have to wait another two weeks. So really, um, it's almost in my opinion, I think with Omicron here, we need to be acting for at least the next two months um, along the lines of vaccination doesn't do as much as it did before. Um, even double Pfizer, the like data out of UK released at noon today shows that it offers less than 40% protection against Omicron symptomatic infection. Um, so we can't just sit back and say, look, we've got vaccinations. Um, you know, we, we really need to now focus on the other Swiss cheese layers um, because vaccinations now 
it's a bigger hole in that layer. Yeah, very much so. And the reliance eat on um, what they call natural immunization uh, in terms of uh, people having had it before, which is actually allowed in terms of arrival, right? You have to have double vaccinated or prove you've tested positive within a certain number of days or months or whatever, and then you're allowed to come into Canada, right? So, um, which, sorry, that sounds like, uh, and I'm... I'm actually super worried. I have my grandchildren hopefully coming from Scotland uh, in, in only in less than two weeks. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because particularly because unfortunately of the eight year old who goes to school without a mask and has been for months there. Um, and it, it is quite scary for her and for and for the 91 year olds who we will be also, you know, are her great grandparents. Um, so there's a lot lots to consider. So I was uh, looking for other questions. I think uh, John's been doing a great job of answering some of the ventilation ones, but I thought there was another question for David. I think, well, you asked the question about the furnace. I don't know if anybody has a question that you don't think has been answered, um, uh, then you can unmute and ask it as well. And I had one more question actually Jen, the duckbill ones from Staples, are those at their FFP2, are they N95? You said uh, 3M yeah. or N? They're a 3M um, uh, NIOSH N95. There's two models of the V-Flex. One, I think, has a higher um, uh, fluid resistance uh, for the hospital, but this one's still excellent fluid resistance, the one from Staples. So this one will say non-medical on it and all of that, but... Um, I'm not having people, you know, spray fluids on me at work. So <laughs> I'm not concerned about that. Um, and it's, uh, it's very comfortable. And have um, you tried any other of the children's ones besides Canada Strong? I think uh, Vitacor makes one now. And have you tried yeah. those? I, I personally haven't, but my uh, sister's son, uh, who's two, uh, it's a little big on him. Obviously, he's pretty small, but um, they seem excellent. And uh, another one of my friends just got to order of those in, and her daughter, it fits her daughter really well, actually, who's around four. Um, I just see there's one other comment about whether we should be wearing fit to, or like properly fitted respirators in something like a grocery store. Personally, I think yes, um, unless you know for sure that, the, like, I have a CO2 monitor. I literally bring it around now. Um, so if I, like, on my drive to Toronto last night, um, we stopped at an en route. It was basically empty, and the CO2 was, like, 500, and there was no one in there. So I felt comfortable to stay, there, sit there for a few minutes and have a snack with a mask off. Um, but um, had it been crowded and or the CO2 was, like, you know, a thousand, I would have made a different decision. So I think it does allow you to make sort of, you, it's all about sort of risk strategy, you know, risk uh, strategization. I can't say that word. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so I personally do wear if, uh, my respirators to the grocery store. Um, and uh, I think it's probably a good idea unless you did have really good data about what they were doing from a air quality perspective and you knew it wasn't going to be that crowded especially given how transmissible omicron is like i think we shouldn't take too many chances there no exactly it's almost like the beginning uh, except that it's much more infectious but uh, um, but that people don't have the protection either uh, as when the wuhan strain started at the very beginning to some extent right not not necessarily from the severity perspective we don't know that yet right we don't know because it could be six weeks or more and we've, we know the math meaning more cases more very sick people uh undoubtedly so it is it is serious for the holidays and then what happens after the holidays which was the whole intent of today's session we hope that you've uh you know, we will uh, post the, the slides online You've, and we'll post a, uh, and include it in uh, Kevin's slides is a link to um, to Jen's video, which I think is so excellent on showing, um, you know, that fit matters so much and that there are a bunch of different ways to get it and, um, and relatively affordable ways too. And the same thing, um, ventilation sounds like it's a big and complex problem to solve, but the... Um, as uh, David showed us and as John's tool shows, the trying to change, just changing from an ordinary furnace filter to a micro pleated uh, um, um, 
MERV 13 or uh, 3M 1900 filter, which won't have any more resistance, maybe less resistance, maybe better for your furnace, is actually a massive improvement and running the furnace on on, right? So that the air circulates um, completely and that kind of thing. So um, I don't know if anybody has, we are past our time, which is generally the way because there's always um, lots of things to talk about. And I do really um, appreciate the time and the knowledge and its translation of our speakers, um, Jen and Ryan and Kevin and David. 